one thing that's important, we've seen it in several of these terrorist attacks, is for the average citizen to fight back, to pick up whatever is to hand and bludgeon the terrorist over the head with it until he stops being able to be a threat. To get Brexit. Make America great again. No, no, no. This is Stephen Edgington for The Sun, and today I'm interviewing Colonel Richard Kemp. Colonel Richard Kemp has spent his whole life fighting insurgencies and terrorists all around the world. He was also in 2013 put on an, on an Al Qaeda death list. We're going to be talking all about counter terrorism, Colonel Richard Kemp's life, and also his advice to young people today. Colonel Richard Kemp, thank you very much for joining us. So you've got a fantastic military career, you were a veteran for, for over 30 years and the main theme of your service was fighting insurgencies and terrorism all around the world, whether that's on the front line or up in the, the highest levels in the cabinet office for, for a very long period of time in some absolutely fascinating areas of war. You were in Afghanistan, Iraq, the Balkans, Northern Ireland where you served eight tours. Um, I want to begin on that day after school, what, the, the one day after school in 1977 um, when you first joined the British Army. What was going through your mind? Yeah, I, I literally, as you suggest, left school one day and joined the army the next. Um, and it was, it was always my ambition and my intention to be a soldier. I never had any other career plans from as early as I can ever remember. So I simply uh, left school and went into the army and I didn't look back for almost 30 years. And I had a, a fantastic time. I enjoyed virtually every minute of it and I would do it all over again. Am I right in saying that the first kind of experience you had of combating insurgency, combating terror, was in Northern Ireland? I think you were 19, weren't you, at the time, when you were sent out to Belfast. Young people today might forget what the troubles were all about, they might forget how bloody it was and how sort of horrific many of the events uh, that happened there. Can you explain to young people, and to, or to just our viewers generally, what it was like being on the ground in Northern Ireland during the troubles and the kind of crimes that the IRA were committing and the kind of how just absolutely horrible and nasty it was. I mean, these were real terrorists blowing up ordinary civilians in Britain and obviously in Northern Ireland. Sometimes in, in, the, in the face of Islamist terrorism in the UK and elsewhere, when we see suicide terrorism, we see what the Islamic State have been doing in Syria and other places, the real depredation that they uh, inflict on the world, people sort of somehow have this romantic idea of the IRA as a good terrorist. Well, they certainly were not the good terrorists. The IRA were uh, some of the most um, proficient terrorists in terms of their effectiveness in blowing people up and killing them and murdering them and torturing them. But they were extremely nasty people um, who terrorised the local communities. They terrorised their own communities, often taking their own people hostage and using them for terrorist purposes. And they terrorised the, the other side, the Protestant uh, population in Northern Ireland and you could go from one to the other, you could go from the Protestant to the Catholic areas um, and the contrast was immense. Very often you'd get um, a, a really very very nasty reception in a Catholic area. Sometimes you get much more friendly reception when uh, for example when they weren't being seen by the IRA or Sinn Féin hard men who would enforce their rule. If you got people one to one, they'd be they you know they'd be ordinary decent people in many of these places. And then you go to the Protestant area, and obviously the the situation is very different. There were of course terrorists who sometimes targeted the security forces in the Protestant areas, but generally speaking, much more friendly. Um, and you know it was a it was a uh, a, a situation where you had. Any, anyone who was suspected, for example, of being an informant for the security forces could guarantee to be kept taken off the streets, taken away, tortured and eventually killed, um, often with, you know, with apparent great pleasure by uh, the IRA terrorists who were doing it. They would, they would uh, lie in wait for soldiers in, the, in, in attics or in up, upper windows of a house waiting for them to walk up the road and then with a sniper rifle with blowing their brains out they'd, they'd set up one of my soldiers for example got killed um, by an improvised explosive device in a drain pipe outside a pub on the Falls Road and literally someone would be watching and the soldier would patrol past and then as he patrolled past they'd press a button and the bomb would go off and this was quite a common form of activity. In South Armagh where I served on a few occasions um, you, if you looked at photographs now 
of South Armagh as it was then, with the exception of the uniforms and the weapons, you would think it was a First World War battlefield because we lived in trenches. We had duck boards we were walking upon. We lived underground, underground um, dugouts, uh, protecting the border between North and South. And so a very big contrast, um, a lot of violence. You could not travel in a vehicle, a wheeled vehicle, for example, in South Armagh. It had to be either on foot or in a helicopter because vehicle travel was uh, extremely dangerous throughout the time that I was there. And then in places like Londonderry, which was the, f the last place I served in, um, there were massive riots which required hundreds, thousands sometimes of troops to, contra to contain, and police, to contain and control the rioting crowds, which were intent on not just co inflicting damage, disorder, chaos, but, but in some cases were accompanied by terrorists who were determined to kill people. So a full range of, of challenges that, that British soldiers faced in that, in that period. I want to contrast your experiences on the ground with how people view that today. Now, it must worry you that Sinn Féin in the Republic of Ireland has just won the most votes in their general election. Um, and also we've had Jeremy Corbyn, obviously the leader of the opposition, almost became Prime Minister in 2017 and obviously had another go in 2019 where he lost very dramatically, but still, he was just one step away from becoming the Prime Minister. And he himself invited IRA terrorists into Parliament. He's consistently throughout his career made statements which, to put it lightly, support certain people from the IRA. Um, people kind of view Sinn Féin as this freedom fighting organisation, but they've got strong, strong links with the IRA. Is that worrying to you and why do you think that that's happening? Why do you think that people with these views and who supported and, and were involved with these terrorists um, are at the forefront of politics around the world? Well, th there's no question of the linkage between Sinn Féin and the IRA. They're one and the same organisation, absolutely one and the same. And a, a recent report, a recently reiterated report by the Police Service of Northern Ireland confirmed that Sinn Féin is controlled by the IRA General Council today, Sinn Féin North and South, including the Sinn Féin that did so well recently in the Irish elections. Um, so there's no, there is no difference between the two organisations, they're one and the same. Um, and the likes of Jeremy Corbyn, who um, claims to have been involved in the peace process, but actually everybody who was involved in the process, peace process denies that he had a role in it. He was actually on one side. He wasn't uh, an arbitrator. He was, didn't look at both sides and try and uh, arrive at some kind of peaceful solution. He supported the IRA. He supported them conclusively, documented so many different ways, uh, because he is anti-Britain. He is an anti-British politician. He's anti-American, he's anti-everything we stand for. And that's why he wanted to see the IRA succeed and see them break Northern Ireland away from the United Kingdom, and still does today. But fortunately, it's history. Fortunately, we won't have to uh, endure any, any further official support from the IRA for some, from a government minister. Um, but I think one thing we should remember, and it, it, it's a sickening situation, is that we have British troops, several British troops today, who are about to be prosecuted for alleged uh, criminal activity in Northern Ireland, as well as many, many more, dozens if not hundreds of British troops who served in Northern Ireland being investigated for, for, for alleged crimes. And often these go back half a century. So half a century later, British soldiers are being accused and being dragged into court in their old age for uh, crimes for which they have been investigated previously and exonerated previously and sometimes on more than one occasion. What is the reason for this? The reason is simple. Sinn Féin have driven this campaign, this political, legal um, attack against British soldiers. They've driven it in order to rewrite history so that they can portray the British army as the oppressors and their people, their IRA people, as freedom fighters. That's what they want to achieve. They have no en expectation, in my opinion, that any of these soldiers will be convicted because I think it's highly unlikely. Such a long time ago, evidence is not there that, that wasn't there years ago either. Um, yet they, they want to get them into court because they, they see this spectre of soldiers in court as, being, as confirming their version of history. And that's what it's all about. And why does the government allow it? Why is the government allowing people who risked their lives and served alongside their friends who gave their lives for the freedom and the liberty and the safety of citizens in Northern Ireland because the government uh, feels it's necessary to appease Sinn Féin in case they split away or, or cease to be closely adhering to the, the, the peace process. So I think it's time, it is time, the Prime Minister said he's going to end these historic persecutions 
um, of British soldiers, and I think he needs to do so, and needs to do so very, very quickly before we have any more tragedies, such as a, a soldier, an ex-soldier who recently took his own life, which some people certainly believe may have been connected with the prosecution he was facing. You've preempted my question, um, but let's talk about that. Let's go into a bit more depth because the IRA uh, veterans, as it were, they're not being prosecuted um, at the moment. But the British government, for some reason, is going after uh, our British veterans now. Julian Smith, the sort of now sacked Northern Ireland secretary, um, as a part of the power sharing deal that he's just come to an arrangement with um, in Northern Ireland to bring back Stormont, uh, there is some talk about again bringing back those prosecutions of British soldiers when Boris Johnson said that that wouldn't happen. Uh, so what is it? Why is there a contrast between letting the IRA people off, off the cuff for their terrible, terrible crimes and then coming after British soldiers? Why is that? Well, the IRA terrorists have been um, given letters of comfort, they've been given royal pardons, they've been let out of prison early for some very, very heinous murders. Um, and meanwhile, the, the legal system is going after the British soldiers. It's very similar, actually, to... Um, the situation we've seen over Iraq and Afghanistan where British soldiers have also been dragged through, you know, sometimes courts, sometimes lengthy um, in investigations lasting decades for alleged crimes which all have turned out, with very few exceptions, have turned out to be um, false, false allegations, lies perpetrated by people who have been trying to uh, either get money from the British government or indeed to smear the name of British soldiers. So this, this is part of this, and, that, and the reason they were allowed to go forward in the way they were was really two things, one of which was um, to appease those people who are our enemies um, and to say, yeah, of course, we, we will kill terrorists in Afghanistan and Iraq. We will also deal with our own soldiers when they uh, do something wrong. But also um, because we have foolishly we signed up to the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction um, and the government is fearful and rightly fearful that if they don't, aren't seen to be extremely enthusiastic about um, investigating and prosecuting where, where they can, soldiers accused of war crimes, then these, those same soldiers will be dragged into The Hague and accused of war crimes there by the International Criminal Court, which, of course, would be politically disastrous for Britain. Um, so it was, and many of us predicted at the time, that it was a big mistake to go and join up with the ICC, and I believe we should leave that now. Um, of course, when soldiers commit crimes, they should be investigated for those crimes and when necessary punished for those crimes. But there is a big difference, I think, between a terrorist who sets out to carry out murder, blow people up, kill people, destroy property, who sets out with that one purpose in mind, and a soldier who sets out with the, willing to give his life if necessary, but sets out to protect innocent lives and protect civilians and protect property, and then is somehow through either his own miscalculation or the circumstances he faces and finds himself in, does something he shouldn't do. Now that might, may or may not be a crime, but it's not a crime. Those, when it is a crime, it's not a crime in the same way as a terrorist crime, and it should be looked at differently. And we saw, for example, you know, going slightly off Northern Ireland, but we saw Marine A, who was prosecuted and convicted of murder for uh, killing a, a, a Taliban terrorist in um, in Afghanistan. Now what he did was wrong. It was illegal what he did, but the conditions in which he did it, uh, as his appeal certainly um, proved later, um, re re were, were extreme stress um, and you know, his, a mental condition which caused him to act out of character. And, and you know, we shouldn't forget that soldiers face, you know, when I first went to Northern Ireland myself, Soldiers were under immense pressure. They were, they were working around the clock. They were living in disgusting conditions. They were being treated and abused on the streets like dogs, like animals, worse than animals. Um, and they faced some very challenging situations. And you can't look at them in the same light as you look at somebody who commits a crime in South London or somebody who sets out with a deliberate intention of murder. Yes, you should deal with people when they do commit crimes, but, but this is a, we, we are looking at, I think, very different situations. And the, the supreme argument, in my opinion, is that in every single case, these soldiers have been investigated. Um, the, the alleged crimes they committed have been investigated, and they've been exonerated of those crimes. It's like, who are we to judge as civilians who've never served, for example, a politician like Jeremy Corbyn on these soldiers, as you, as you say, are under, under immense pressure and the circumstances can be completely different. So it's a really interesting contrast. And again, I think I want to link in with that, with how we treat veterans 
just generally in Britain? Because uh, I'll give you a, a sort of small anecdote. Probably doesn't mean anything, but uh, when I go out to America and sit in the sort of um, uh, the the airport and I hear veterans, you go on first. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, the, the Purple Heart uh, campaign that they have, where they give medals to the. The, 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 uh, the veterans there. And also, um, you know, you've had this campaign about 10 years ago uh, to ha have a British version of a, of a Purple Heart. Can you talk about how we treat veterans, how we view veterans in Britain compared to the States, for example, and perhaps we should all be a bit more respectful, perhaps we should give them a bit more time of day in Britain, a bit more kind of remembrance? I think, I think um, the, the attitude towards veterans and serving soldiers from the average population in the US is very different to the UK uh, for a variety of reasons. But you mentioned the Purple Heart. Um, I was involved in a campaign which, which wanted to institute an equivalent of the Purple Heart for, for British soldiers so that those who were killed or wounded received formal recognition for that in the form of a medal of some sort. That, was, that campaign lasted for, for, I think, a couple of years. And my proposals were rejected outright by the Ministry of Defence, by the general staff, uh, not so much by the politicians, but by senior army officers and, and military officers. Um, and the argument they were making was, we don't want to be like the Americans, do we? Um, which, and the, you know, the various other spurious arguments, but that was the critical one, I think, which of course is nonsense. And ultimately, um, the, 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 the generals were led kicking and screaming, really resisting, to creating the Elizabeth Cross, which is now awarded to the next of kin of service men and women killed in action or killed as a result of terrorist attacks, which is just part of it. It's an important part of it, but it was only part of it. And the, 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 the desire to have formal recognition to soldiers who are wounded in action and, and sailors and airmen was not achieved so far. I hope it will be one day, but it was rejected roundly. And as I mentioned, the poli you know, most politicians, we, we, we launched a petition in Parliament, uh, an early day motion, which received the, the greatest amount of support of all early day motions in that uh, session of Parliament. So there was a lot of political support for it. There was support among many veterans, including you know, retired generals, retired admirals and air marshals, but the serving um, senior officers, for, for whatever reason, didn't want to go along with it. And I think in some ways it's... it's um, it, it, it's it's a, a, a real shame because if you look at an individual, I mean, somebody who falls over and scratches their knee, yeah, well, that's a hazard of life, and people do it in different places. If you lose your legs or lose your arms or get blind or deafened, if you get you know, paralyzed from the waist down or whatever, which many of our soldiers have been uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq and before that in Northern Ireland and, and, and elsewhere, then I believe you deserve recognition by the state for what you've done. And you know, many soldiers actually do feel guilty about being wounded. Um, and it's, it's quite a common trait. And I think that guilt would be assuaged to an extent by being given you know, a formal recognition that we recognize your sacrifice that you've made. Canada, for example, the Queen awards the sacrifice medal to Canadian soldiers who have been severely wounded in action. But she doesn't award it to her own soldiers. Not her choice. She would, you know, if she was bidden to do so, she would do it. Um, but it is, it's, it's, in my opinion, it, it is a real problem, which is sort of a little bit characteristic of the extent of appreciation we have for our troops. I don't think British soldiers want, uh, you know, we're not quite the same as Americans, and I don't think we want somebody stopping us in the street and saying, thank you for your service and all that. I mean, yeah, it doesn't hurt, but I don't think we necessarily welcome that kind of applause. What I do think is recognition of the kind I've been describing proper medical and health care treatment, being looked after financially, not only the soldier but the soldier's family, um, once he's either been killed or seriously wounded. I think those are very, very important things which we have neglected a great deal in the past and I think we're, we're getting better at it but we need to get even better at it. I want to talk about counter-terrorism today because we've talked about Northern Ireland which is still massively relevant but it's the biggest threat to, from counter-terrorism is from radical Islam, I mean, pretty much accepted worldwide. Um, so let's talk about the run-up to that in your career and then we'll link it into today. So 2001, 9-11 changes the world. Everything changes. I want to know where were you and what was your reaction at the time? In, on 9-11 I was um, training the parachute regiment for a deployment to Kosovo uh, for a, a completely separate operation to anything connected with 9-11. Um, and 
we, we paused the training we were doing in Colchester, uh, in Essex, we paused the training we were doing in order to look at the films, the live shots and immediately pre-recorded shots of the aircraft crashing into the Twin Towers. And I think I and everybody else looking at it recognised that our life as soldiers were probably going to be changed by this. Obviously we were horrified by the tragedy of what happened in New York, but we also looked forward to the way it would affect us and we knew it would affect us. We knew that from that moment onwards, really, the world would change. And the likelihood is that we would be involved in conflict in the Middle East and in Asia um, in connection with these uh, attacks that had taken place. There had been plenty of previous terrorist attacks by um, Al-Qaeda and other Islamic extremists, which we, certainly I, uh, had studied and understood to an extent. Um, but this was a sort of the ball game had changed here when there was for the first time ever, I think, you know, that we were aware of anyway, there was a, a mass casualty attack by an organisation that was prepared to inflict limitless casualties. There was no limit on what they were prepared to do, and that, I think, was a, a hugely significant fact. Um, and, and really, uh, our lives did change. And after that, I went to Macedonia, and I became, for a period of time, about six months, uh, the uh, counter-terrorism advisor to the Prime Minister of Macedonia. And then I returned in early 2002 to, um, to London where I um, was involved with setting up a team that um, in, the, in the Joint Intelligence Committee which, with specific responsibility for analysing uh, and assessing terrorist, international terrorist intelligence to brief the Prime Minister and, f and that was then my life for the next six years effectively. Now what's absolutely fascinating about your career is that before 9-11 you spent a long, long time fighting terrorists all around the world in insurgencies. Now you served in the first Gulf War, for example, uh, in the 19, early 1990s, um, and then this huge, huge event happens, 9-11, and you're brought in from the front line to the highest levels of government in the Cabinet Office for, was it about five years, um, and then you retired from, from the armed forces. Um, let's talk about the overall strategy of the war on terror, as they described it at the time. Now, as I said, you had that individual experience of fighting it on the ground to then going to the highest levels of government. Can you first of all talk about the contrast between people who perhaps hadn't have served against terrorists, hadn't sort of met terrorists before in their lives, hadn't dealt with them, um, and then the people who had, like yourself, who kind of might have had a different perspective on things, on how to fight uh, terrorism all around the world in the sort of early 2000s? Yeah, I mean, I, I, was, um, <clears throat> I was in quite a unique position. I was working mainly with um, people from the intelligence services, from MI5, MI6, GCHQ, people who actually had, in, in many cases, a great deal of experience of uh, counter-terrorist intelligence work and had, had served and lived in the Middle East for much of their lives in some cases, some very, very experienced intelligence operatives, uh, as well as civil servants from the Home Office, the Foreign Office, um, the Cabinet Office and elsewhere, some of whom had experience, most of whom didn't have much experience of this problem because, of course, um, after 9-11, the whole thing was ratcheted up. And we, for example, we, I was involved in the formation of JTAC, the Joint Terrorism Analysis Centre in MI5, um, which was a large organisation suddenly created from nothing, consisting of a lot of people, most of whom didn't have any experience of it. Um, so it was, a, it was an interesting situation to be placed in. And my experience was primary. I'd served in the Middle East. I'd served in the first Gulf War. I got work extensively with the Saudis, with, to some extent with the Kuwaitis, with other Arabs out there. Um, so I had some experience of that region. Um, but most of my experience was, was with terrorism related to Northern Ireland uh, and, in some, and to an extent the, uh, the Balkans. And um, th there was a big difference. It was a, a difference of mentality and mindset. Um, and it was not possible to directly translate experience from that form of terrorism to the new threat we were facing. There were some commonalities and some important aspects. And I think one of the things that I recognised was um, the, ne the need, I think, for direct action, to be willing to take direct military action against um, terrorists when the opportunity presented and when appropriate. And I wasn't in a military position. I was actually not part, I wasn't serving, I was a soldier still, but I wasn't serving as a soldier. I was effectively um, working within a civilian organisation. Um, and for example, after, after British soldiers were, um, a large number of British soldiers had been killed and wounded 
by um, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the Iranian organization, uh, the Quds Force that was commanded by uh, Soleimani, the late Sol um, Qasim Soleimani. Um, he, he and his people had been responsible for killing British soldiers. And I, I, was rec I recommended not, not just diplomatic action against Iran in relation to those killings, but military action, which w actually was rejected. My, my recommendations were not taken up. But then, you know, the, the people making the decisions, i.e. the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary, had um, a, a bigger perspective than I did. But nevertheless, I, I felt that there was, there was a need to, to, to send a message, not just by diplomatic means, but by actual precise military operations. I don't necessarily mean invading Iran. I'm talking about mainly special forces type operations. Um, and so that was, that was a kind of, I think, a, an angle that, that I was able to bring. And I was responsible also for, um, for, for briefing um, the, the foreign secretary and the prime minister on occasions on special forces operations that were outside the UK, um, on briefing them on the, on the intelligence picture and the threat picture. Um, which again, you know, I, 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 I think there were plenty of other people who could have done that, but the way I was able to combine it with my own experience of actually being on the ground, including being on the ground in Afghanistan by that stage, I think was, uh, you know, hopefully made, made a bit of a difference. So I want to read a quote um, from the Canadian uh, General Commanding International Forces uh, in 2003. Now, you served in Afghanistan in 2003. You took a six-month break from your work in the Cabinet Office um, to command British forces in Afghanistan. And, and this is, the Canadian said, quote, his efforts led directly to the most successful offensive counter-terrorist operations in Kabul, with several key terrorist leaders now under arrest, significantly setting back the enemy campaign. Can you talk a little bit about what your strategy was when you were in Afghanistan commanding those British troops um, to terrorism and to those terrorist leaders? I think <coughs> one, one thing to, to clarify is that we're not talking about Helmand and province. We're not talking about the intensity of terrorist attacks that our forces experienced and American forces and others experienced in Helmand a few years later. We're talking about um, uh, Kabul in 2003, which had, th there was a, quite a lot of terrorist activity there, but it was nothing like as intense as it later became. Uh, and there was a tendency, uh, because Kabul was controlled by, effectively by a NATO coalition. It wasn't really Americans. Americans weren't really operating in Kabul. They were operating outside um, the city, the capital, and, in, you know, f further south, etc. And I think because of that, there was, there was uh, less of a, an aggressive approach to terrorism. And there was more of a willingness, not by every commander there, but certainly by many of the commanders in Kabul, there's a willingness to, to just hope it goes away and to smooth it over and, and so on and not go after these people. Um, but I, I took a different line and I was in a very fortunate position of being able to cobble together a, a kind of a... a uh, an organization made up of US Marine Corps intelligence agents or operatives and British troops. And the Americans, the, the US Marines, had an intelligence organization that wasn't really doing very much in Kabul. Uh, and I was able to harness them and eff effectively co opt them unofficially into the British forces um, and use them in conjunction with, with British troops who had a, a significant combat power there. And we were able to, to use that intelligence and to use the British troops to track these people down and to make arrests and, and carry out attacks and raids against their premises. And it was something that threw them onto the back foot. It caused huge headaches in many ways for, um, for, 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 for not so much for me, but certainly for people back here in London, because it wasn't the kind of operation that had been ca carried out before. And it did involve serious questions like interrogation, questions like um, what you do with somebody once they've been arrested in those conditions. Uh, you know, and we had to create our own prison for a period of time in which to detain some of these people. So there were many, and you know, the, the, all the complications that go along with that. So there were many complicated factors, but I felt that it was much more important to, to take, to even to stick your neck out and take severe risks to to get these people off the streets and to stop them from killing NATO forces, which they wanted to do, and to stop them from killing the civilian population, which they also wanted to do. And I think as General Leslie there, who was a you know, very effective Canadian commander in Kabul at the time, I think as he rightly said, it, it did a lot of damage and set back 
uh, al-Qaeda operations in Kabul by, by quite a few years. It's really interesting. You've used, throughout this interview, you used the word appeasement quite a lot. You've talked about direct action. Uh, I think that probably goes to your whole kind of ethos of keep attacking, as you say in your Twitter bio, which is fantastic. Um, the, kind of, the whole point is direct action. You've got to go and tackle these people. Don't appease. Don't just sit around doing nothing and hope for a diplomatic, diplomatic um, end to the violence. Try and actually get in there and, 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 do, and do some direct action. So that's absolutely fascinating. And we'll, and we'll talk about your ethos towards the end of the, the, the interview more generally. Um, but let's specifically about counterterrorism today. Uh, obviously a lot has changed in the last 20 years, but we're still getting consistent terrorist attacks in places like London, in Western Europe, in, in Paris, in America even. Um, is th has the war on terror worked overall, do you think, looking back over all those years? And what can we do to stop these terrorist attacks now? Because you've got lone wolf people, people who don't even communicate with ISIS, for example, uh, over telecommunications, you might just use a car, very low-tech terror attacks or just a knife. So is it just, it's becoming almost impossible to stop these people? I think um, as, as the terrorists become more sophisticated at operating under the radar without being detected, which is increasingly easy in many ways today, but so have our intelligence services become increasingly sophisticated at uh, dealing with that. And, and, and over time, uh, and certainly going back for, to, you know, to my experiences immediately after 9-11, the extent to which our intelligence and security services, particularly MI5 and MI6 and GCHQ, and the Metropolitan Police and other police forces have, have advanced and developed in their ability to penetrate and infiltrate um, and gain intelligence about terrorist cells in this country and overseas, uh, I think is incredibly impressive. They went from a pretty low level, relatively low level, to, to what is now a very, very effective operation in which many, many more terrorist attacks in this country are prevented than actually begin to unfold, whether they succeed or whether they go wrongly, but at least they don't start in many cases because of what uh, MI5, MI6, the police, etc. do. And, and that is a very good and impressive thing. But of course, it isn't a strategy. It's it, dealing with the situation as it occurs. And, and when you look at it, so much of the problem, as you kind of alluded to, is um, is lone wolf, as they call it, attacks, which may be not the best possible description, but it does sort of describe uh, a, a threat that consists of individuals who are motivated by, um, let's say, by uh, uh, um, material on the internet that's directed at them, uh, or indeed, by, in some cases, by uh, radical preachers, etc., in some mosques in this country and in other places. Um, but they're individuals who are, who are targeted and motivated and join the cause, but then do what they want to do. They don't need to be connected with an extensive network. When you have a network of terrorists, that can be penetrated. You can, they've got to communicate, they've got to get together from time to time, and you can get to them through that means. If it's an individual operating alone, it's almost impossible, unless you're lucky enough to have an informant close to the individual or somebody with, who sees something suspicious um, informs the authorities. Otherwise, you're, you know, it's extremely uh, un unlikely you will get, get to that individual. Um, so so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a wide ranging set of problems. And I think our intelligence services are doing a good job at it. I think we need to help them. I've forgotten the latest number that's quoted by the head of MI5 as being the, the, the people of serious concerns on the streets of, from an Islamic terrorist point of view. Uh, but it is a very large number and it's a growing number. Um, and we have to do what we can to reduce that number because you could never, no, no intelligence service in this country could ever be given enough resources to monitor all of those people, whatever, what, however many thousands it is that the head of MI5. I think it's in the tens of thousands. Tens of thousands, yeah, exactly. And, and you could never monitor all those people. And we saw a recent stabbing event in, in London of an individual that was being monitored and still he managed to stab some people before he was then killed. Um, and, and how do we do that? Well, the first thing we have to do, the first measure we must take and should take is to prevent anybody who has been overseas fighting jihad in somewhere like Syria and Iraq from ever coming back here again. They should never come home. They should be dealt with where they are. The Syrian authorities, the Kurds, the Iraqi authorities, whoever is in a position to deal with them should deal with them there. If we can kill them when they're there, then we should kill them. Something we should do to prevent them. I'm not talking about illegal killing. I'm talking about lawful um, means of killing them. Somehow we stop them coming back. Uh, if we, uh, because if we don't, then those people are 
blooded, they're trained, they're prepared, they're directed, they're ready to carry out murder here in this country. And they, in some cases, have done so, and in other cases will do so in the future. Um, if they don't come back, they can't do it. And the second way in which we can reduce the problem that our intelligence services face is by removing those people from this country who we suspect of terrorist activity, who can be deported. If they can be deported to Pakistan or to Bangladesh or to an Arab country, wherever they come from, then they should be sent back there as soon as possible. Without the necessity of a trial, there should be legal process to ensure they are not, they're not treated unfairly, but they should be, they should be deported uh, if they're strongly suspected, if there's evidence to suggest that they are involved in terrorism. Um, and then the third means, I think is to, is to seriously consider, and this is the most difficult problem of all, but seriously consider uh, internment or detention without trial of individuals who cannot be deported or in the country, who we suspect are going to be involved with terrorism or are involved with terrorism, but there is not sufficient evidence to convict them in a court. And that could be because we're working on secret intelligence, which uh, either is not going to be um, usable in court or we don't want to use it in court because it compromises sources that could save other lives. But they again should be con subjected to a judicial process, not just locked up on the whim of an intelligence officer or of a police officer, but going through special courts to, uh, to, to place them in detention. Now that is a huge problem. Uh, I, I mean some people say well there'll be an outcry among say the Muslim community, but I don't think there would be because the Muslims are very often the, the greatest victims of the kind of terrorism that, that are perpetrated in this situation. And surely, like everybody else, they would welcome measures that are taken to safeguard them. Muslims are the greatest victims of Islamic terrorism by far across the world. So I, I, I can understand it's problematic, but I think it's something that should be looked at. As in the round, as part of the whole problem we face today of how you, um, how you deal with people who have been involved in terrorism, and you look at situations where, uh, and again, there was a recent case of somebody who was, who'd been in prison, had been released early from their prison sentence, had carried out terrorist attacks again. What do you do with them? It's, it, it, you've got, there's got to be consideration given to locking them up permanently, permanently. War, prisoners of war always were detained until the war was over. The war we're facing today is never going to end. It's not a war that's sometime going to stop. It's always going to be going on. And these people, in many cases, are always going to be fighting it. So you've touched on there some, a really interesting point about a terrorist to act. I think there was maybe even two recently of people who have been released from prison early and then have immediately, even the next day or the next week, gone out and committed uh, another terrorist attack. Um, there's a huge debate in this country, in Britain, about whether we should keep terrorists uh, locked up forever, uh, for their whole lives. Um, can terrorists be rehabilitated at all? Can all terrorists be re rehabilitated? Or is that just it, that that's enough, we've got to lock them up forever? I think there are some people who have been involved in terrorism, and I know some people who have been involved in terrorism personally, who are reformable, who um, actually not only no longer are involved in terrorism, but actually are actively working against t terrorists. So that, of course there are some people in those categories. Um, but I think you, you can never be sure in some cases that somebody is going to cease to be involved with, with terrorist activities. And some of these people are absolutely fanatics. They, they, you know, they're, they're, they're brainwashed and they're indoctrinated into believing that what they're doing is right and, and is their religious duty to do it. Uh, and they will never stop doing it, no matter what, uh, even at the risk of their own life. And of course, one of the big problems with this type of terrorism is their willingness to, to die for their cause. Um, and, and so I think you know, there, there, are, there are people in, in that category and countries like Saudi Arabia, for example, and one or two other countries around the world claim to have a good success rate um, at de-radicalizing people who are involved in terrorist activity. And I was involved at various points in, in examining these, uh, these programs that they run and looking at them for the, their efficacy. Um, and I've never been convinced, really. I, I think that you know, there are big claims made for them in some cases. Sometimes they've been successful in individual cases, but I don't think you can ever say that there is a science to de-radicalization. And I think there is also a big difference between de-radicalizing somebody in, let's say, Pakistan or de-radicalizing them in Saudi Arabia to de-radicalizing them in the UK, because the, 
th th those countries are effectively Islamic countries. This is not an Islamic country. Uh, and so, you know, in, in the eyes of the people that we're looking to de-radicalize, what right do these non-Muslims have to, to, to tell me what the proper form is of Islam is and what I should and shouldn't do under Islam, which is part of the, the, uh, the de-radicalization process. So I think for, for, for Islamic terrorists over here, I think it's almost an intractable problem in some cases, not in every case. Uh, and therefore, we really do need to be looking at the possibility of locking them up, keeping them out of the way permanently. And when a, when a terrorist sentence ends, then, you know, obviously they're going to be sentenced for the crime they've committed. But then one has to consider after that what, what happens. And, and I think we should look at the idea of extended detention after the end of a sentence, in, in some cases at least. There's a kind of view in Britain that those on the left, especially the far left, let's say the Jeremy Corbyn types of this world, the Diane Abbotts, um, they're a bit soft on terrorism, they're soft on crime. I think that's one of the reasons that the, the Labour Party had the worst results since 1935 last year in the general election. And, you know, Diane Abbott, for example, was making sure, uh, defending the fact that um, Shemima Begum, the ISIS uh, terrorist uh, teenager from Britain, um, she, shouldn't, she should be allowed back into the UK. Um, and, you know, Labour generally, especially those like Jeremy Corbyn, would probably be more on the side of, you know, rehabilitating people, um, letting them come back to Britain. It's, it's all about human rights. That's what they claim. And we shouldn't sort of suspend our democracy or suspend our democratic systems and judicial systems um, just because they might commit these crimes. Why do you think that they they have this kind of mentality where they, 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 they look at the problem like that rather than, you know, what I'm trying to do is save as many live British lives as possible and trying to save people from being attacked. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily a strict left-right left, divide. I know you didn't, weren't suggesting that exactly, but, but I, th I've known, I know plenty of people on the left who also have a strong, robust attitude towards terrorism. Um, I think there are some people, as you said, like Jeremy Corbyn, Diane Abbott and, and others in the Labour Party and other parts of the political spectrum who really don't actually get it, or if they do get it, they're on the wrong side. They're actually on the side of the people that are trying to change our society to, to suit them. And that's partly because people like Corbyn don't like our society. Um, but it's, it's, I think it's, um, it's a, uh, the, 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 the thing we should look at, pr the priority we should look at, the primary focus of our mind should be, as you say, protecting the lives of innocent civilians. The human rights and the right to life of innocent people is far, far more important, in my opinion, than the human right of somebody who sets out to murder. Now, they should lose many elements of their human rights. Of course, when they're convicted, they lose a, the right to liberty. Um, but they, their, their rights and their um, positions should be very much secondary to their victims. And that's the way to look at it. We don't look at it, and some, some people don't look at it in that light, and I think the p people on the left in particular don't. Um, and, and what it does, it has the effect of encouraging terrorism. It encourages their actions. And when, for example, you know, certain politicians say, for example, um, you know, if a young Jewish guy from the UK goes out and joins the Israel Defence Force, which some do, and then returns home, he should be treated as a criminal like... Um, uh, somebody who goes and joins the Islamic State. What that does, that gives a seal of endorsement effectively to the Islamic State because the IDF, the Israelis, are our allies. They're a legitimate armed force. So you're saying that you're comparing the two people. Um, and, and I think that encourages terrorism. When, similarly, when you, you know, as I mentioned, Israel, when you look at the, um, the, 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 the uh, condemnation that Israel receives when it dry, tries to defend itself, from politicians here and from other people uh, in international organizations and so-called human rights organizations. Um, that also, that condemnation of Israel, which is no, mostly false condemnation, is uh, encouraging terrorism. It encourages these people to, 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 uh, to carry out more and more violence to get the condemnation. And it's the same uh, in, with domestic terror as well. The more people that understand and, and you know, sympathize and empathize with those who want to blow us up and kill us, um, the more they're going to be encouraged to do it. What do you say to the argument that, again, I think, and it's just a fact, it's mostly made on the left, on the far left, 
and they never quite go as far as saying that Britain or Western countries are responsible or at fault for these terrorist attacks, but they almost imply that by saying Western foreign policy has had huge impacts on the Middle East, we shouldn't have invaded Iraq, we shouldn't have killed all those thousands of civilians, we shouldn't have you know, gone into Syria and bombed Libya and all these things that perhaps were mistakes, perhaps they weren't mistakes, that almost it's kind of our fault that these things are happening. And if we stopped the Western interventions, if we stopped all these mistakes in the Middle East, then perhaps we wouldn't be getting attacked so much. What do you say to that argument? Well, our interventions in the Middle East have um, been varied in, in their judiciousness and in their effectiveness. Um, and some of them have been not, I don't say necessarily that the interventions themselves have been mistaken, but the way they've been carried out have been in some cases mistaken. For example, the invasion of, um, of uh, Iraq, the way that that was handled, not the invasion itself, but the subsequent time after the invasion, that was clearly a big mistake, which shouldn't have been, shouldn't have happened. Certainly in hindsight, it shouldn't have happened. Um, but the, let's go back to the, the start point really for this. It, it's not the start point, but it's an important waypoint at the very beginning of this process, which is the attacks on 9-11. And our interventions in the Middle East and in Asia have been due to 9-11, Sim simple, full stop. 9-11, and I mentioned it before, this was the um, the, the, the first time really that we have faced the threat of people who want to carry out an unlimited terrorist attack against us, who don't care about the number of casualties, in fact who want more casualties, the more casualties the better, which is not a common characteristic of t all terrorists. Uh, and that was a very dangerous situation and, and all of our response since then has been because of that and because of that horror which uh, we can foresee in which we haven't fortunately had repeated in the same way, but in, we have in, on smaller scales on a number of occasions. Um, and, and so, you know, you could say also, if, if um, British forces hadn't invaded Normandy in June 1944, we wouldn't have sustained casualties then, no. But we'd have been ruled and, uh, you know, been run r roughshod over by the Third Reich. Well, we have to fight back when we're faced with these situations with these enemies. We have to fight back against them. We have to attack them uh, or else they will defeat us and they will overrun us and they will rule our societies. And we cannot, we simply cannot allow that. You've been at the forefront of fighting terrorism your whole life, as I said. Um, is there anything that you think is surprising that most people don't know about counter-terrorism? Most people, just ordinary people, the public, the British public generally, what, what surprises them? And uh, is there anything that you can sort of tell them, you know, is it should they be worried when they go to London, for example? What, what kind of tidbits can you give to people to, to sort of reassure them or that they might be surprised about? I think um, people, people sometimes do, and, and understandably, people misunderstand uh, or underestimate um, the, the, the real danger of these groups because um, the, the mindset of an Islamic terrorist, in, in a, bit, a bit like the mindset of a, a Republic, an Irish Republican terrorist, is, is not the same as us. We don't, you know, uh, n uh, very few people in this country could put themselves into the shoes of the, the head of the South Armagh IRA who was prepared to, to carry out mass murder, torture, or do almost anything to kill British troops, almost anything, in the same way as, you know, you can't, it's hard to put yourself into the mind of uh, an Islamic terrorist in the UK who will go and, and you know, knife a, a, a off-duty soldier walking out from Woolwich Barracks, Lee Rigby. It, we, we can't understand it, and so we, we, we tend to have more of a benign attitude towards these, this threat and these people because we think there must be something behind it. We think, going back to the argument you were discussing before, of, you know, we mu must be to blame in some way for, for this stuff. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's something that people should really try and understand a bit better, the fact that we're talking about a completely different mindset to our mindset. We could not do this. We could not be uh, an Irish terrorist. We could not be an Islamic terrorist. We could not be a terrorist of any sort. And I think that's one thing. I think uh, in terms of the, the danger of, of terrorist attack, I think it would be very easy to be paranoid and to, to kind of say, well, I'm not going to London. And a lot of people did say that straight after the 7-7 bombings, I remember. Um, but I think it's... it's uh, um, it's uh, it's it's much better to be more stoic about it. I believe it's like if you say, well, I'm you know if you I'm going to walk over the road, but I could be run over by a car, so I won't walk over the road. Well, I think that's the same kind of outlook. 
you know, that you've got a much greater chance of being run over by a car in this country of being killed by a terrorist. So I don't think people should be obsessed with it and paranoid about it. But I do think they should take a sensible um, precautions. And if they do see suspicious things, if they do see something that they don't like, of, not to be afraid to, to report it, even if they think they're going to be um, seen as being stupid. But if you don't stand up to it, um, it, 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 it consumes you. And, and this is one problem I have with, and I can understand why the advice to, um, to, to the public, if they are in the face of a terrorist attack, is run, hide, tell. I do have a problem with that. And I'm not telling people to ignore that advice because that's the advice coming from the police, who obviously I have immense respect for and they, they have their judgment. I, I think that one thing that's important, we've seen it in several of these terrorist attacks, is for the average citizen to fight back, to pick up whatever is to hand and bludgeon the terrorist over the head with it until he stops being able to be a threat. It's that sort of thing that I think, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, I have huge admiration for for those people, you know, ordinary civilians who have done that, who fought back, as I do for police officers who, either armed or unarmed, um, and I actually happen to believe that every police officer in this country should be armed at all times, but have, have taken on the terrorists, sometimes when their own life is at risk. If you see a terrorist, as we saw in a recent case, wearing what appeared to be a suicide vest, and you're anywhere near him, you're very likely to get killed when he blows it up. So just just the act of getting into a position where you can stay still and shoot him, that is a very brave thing to do for a police officer who understands what happens when the guy presses a button on his suicide vest. So I think, I think you know, those, the two things really is to, to, to try and see that these are not ordinary, normal people like the rest of us, and also to, to be willing to, to, to A, to take a stoical point of view, and B, to stand up and fight when you're faced with a threat. Now, you mentioned 7-7 seven, seven there. That's a, it's a really interesting example because, again, you were in the Cabinet Office at the time um, working with the Joint Intelligence Committee and also with COBRA. Um, so you, you were there when this, when this uh, terrible, horrific event happened where so many people died. I think it was a bomb on a, on a London bus and on, on, on the Tube as well. Um, I think that it was almost a failed attack in, in one sense because they tried to do it on the Tube and it just didn't work and then they did it on the bus. So, so a lot of people did die. It was an absolutely horrific event. Um, but also for you personally, how did it feel? Because obviously you were at the forefront of that. You didn't, I'm presuming you didn't have any warning that it was going to happen, that something, that something really big was going to happen in London. It must have been an absolutely awful thing personally to have to go, go through because, again, you were on the front line of fighting, fighting terrorism. It was, it, we, we had no intelligence to suggest that um, this attack was going to take place, which is not necessarily unusual. Um, and, and, you know, I, I was in a position where I had access to every piece of intelligence available to the British government. There was nothing that suggested this, this was going to occur, or really anything like it. Up until that point, we'd not seen any, any serious consideration given by terrorists to carrying out suicide bomb attacks in London. There had been um, plans by British terrorists to carry out suicide bomb attacks outside the country, but not actually in London. So it was... You know, it wasn't completely unexpected, but it wasn't considered to be a high probability at that time. Um, so it took everybody by surprise. Um, and I think the thing, the thing that impressed me most about the whole uh, aftermath and the reaction to the event was the behaviour of our intelligence services and our police. Within a very short space of time, the intelligence... And I was, I was responsible for coordinating the National Intelligence Service's input into COBRA, into the COBRA Crisis Management Committee. And w within a very short space of time, material was coming in, which built up the picture that was so important because the priority was, was really, the, the overwhelming priority was to get an intelligence picture which enabled us to prevent a subsequent attack if one was planned. That was the most important thing. And, and the way that the intelligence services handled that challenge was, was, I think, very impressive. And the second thing that impressed me enormously was the reaction of the, the Metropolitan Police and the other police forces that came into London to support the Met over that period when, obviously, policing went up to extremely high levels. But the way they operated, their, 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 their detective capability was staggering. It was brilliant, as well as the the capability of the police officers who were ga gathering hard physical intelligence at, at the scene of each of those attacks. And if you think about it, there were police officers from the Metropolitan Police in those tunnels, in those railway tunnels, 
who were g gathering intelligence in the immediate aftermath of an explosion, ga gathering evidence in the immediate aftermath of an explosion, with the body still in place, um, be because before anything could be moved, the, the most important evidence had to be gained to prevent future attacks and to, where possible, to convict for these attacks. Uh, and you know, you you know what happens in a railway tunnel, what the what the scene is there, and these police officers working in among that carnage and devastation, I think, deserve our utmost a, 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 a admiration. As indeed do the police who were involved in the the reassurance operation that was taking place above ground to try and uh, to try and you know to, to to be in a position to react if there was a subsequent attack, and also to reassure people that they could go about their ordinary business without panicking. I want to shift tone slightly and, and end the interview talking about um, people's attitudes towards life generally, people's moral backbones, um, people, people's um, kind of purposes in life. And I think this does link with terrorism because on the, ver on the other end of the things, and we talk talked a lot about Islamic terrorism, you've got far-right terrorists. A lot of these people are young men who feel, and it's really difficult to get behind their motivation to these terrorist attacks, but a lot of people say it's because they feel they have no purpose in life, they feel that no one sort of respects them, um, and they, they've kind of lost their way. There's nothing that's kind of driving their morality. There's nothing that, let's say, for example, the decline of religion might be a factor, and there's many other factors, the rise of social media and, and things like that, and we've seen that over the last couple of decades. I think there are millions of young people, I'm not saying they're all going to be far-right terrorists or anything like that, that's completely extreme end, you know, serious mental health issues there. But you have got young men um, and, young, and young women as well who feel lost, who feel they don't have a purpose in life, who feel that they don't have something to live for. Depression rates are on the up. Suicide, uh, unfortunately, is on the up. And you've seen people like Caroline Flack commit suicide because of um, maybe social media and the media itself. Again, this is a really complex and huge issues that you can't bottle down into one question, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, do you think that people have lost a sense of purpose in the last few decades? Do you think that young people in particular have lost that sense of um, maybe decency and discipline? I think, I think what we've seen is, in many respects, the, the degradation of our society over, certainly over the entirety of my lifetime. I mean, I can remember when I was a child at school, I was never told to be proud to be British. I was always told to be ashamed to be British because we were such evil people who'd had this evil empire in the past. And we, we, we had to be embarrassed and, and ashamed about that. And that was the message at school. It was the message in the media. It wasn't the message in my household, but it was certainly pretty much every influence outside. And I think that, you know, that's going back a very long time ago when I was at school. Um, and it's been progressively getting worse since then. And I think that does, that, that whole attitude towards our history, uh, and we've got a huge amount in this country to be proud of in our history. Yes, we've got some, some things to be ashamed of, but we've got vastly more to be proud of. Uh, yet that's all undermined. We're, we're, we're basically, we're told we are toxic white men or white women, whatever it might be. Um, and you know, we've, we, we, we sh really are not encouraged to have any self-respect. So in that circumstance, as I say, built up over decades and decades, it's hardly surprising there are young people around today who, uh, who you know, maybe do feel they've lost their way and are lost. And I think, I think our government, it doesn't have all the answers to every situation, every problem, but our government definitely needs to, to now, and particularly now that the Conservative Party has a decent majority, they do need to take steps to try and turn some of this stuff around. It's not a, a project that can be turned around overnight. It's going to take decades to reverse it, if it's possible to reverse it. And that includes... Um, the education that people receive in schools. And for example, I would, I would say, I don't have any statistics, I would say the overwhelming majority of secondary school teachers are on the left. And yes, many of them, and I would say particularly science teachers, etc., they teach their subject and that's it. But in some of the other subjects, um, I think many of them are only too willing to share and to push their political perspective onto their students. That's extremely wrong, in my opinion, to do it with, with such a dominant left-wing slant on it. And I think that's something that does need to be addressed. And the same is then carried on into universities. And it is the left, after all. Um, you know, I spent my entire life being politically neutral. I was a soldier and I wasn't left or right. Um, but, but it is the left that's been largely responsible for crumbling our society and for instilling this field of, feel of guilt into us. So I think that's an area to be addressed. And I think another, another problem, of course, is social media. 
and is, is the dominance of the internet, the dominance of smartphones, etc. Now, that's a problem, but it's also a huge, a huge plus in society as well. And I personally use it a great deal, probably a great deal more than I should do. But nevertheless, I think it is potentially problematic. And I believe that, um, that where possible, young people should be encouraged to, to get away from that virtual world and to live in the real world for, to an extent. And there are various ways of doing that, one of which is joining youth organisations and so on. For example, I mean, it's something I know a bit about, which is the Army Cadet Force, the Army Cadet Force, the Combined Cadet Forces in schools. They bring to young people a different dimension they will never see on, um, uh, on social media. They, 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 you know, they, they introduce people to practical skills and to challenges and various forms of adventure training and military training and so on. And it's the same with the scout movement. Things like that, I think, are you know, have been declining in recent years, but are extremely important. And, and it's not for everybody, but everybody should be encouraged at least to, to look at something like that and getting out, getting away from a screen and, and getting into some real life challenge. Because unless you, until and unless you experience uh, a serious challenge to yourself that you're able to overcome, and I don't mean some game getting up to the next level or whatever, but getting on some mountainside or, or in, into some horrific, um, weather conditions in you know where you're where you're um, having to fight for your own survival i think those things in, until you've experienced and overcome those it's quite hard to necessarily put your your own life into perspective and to, and to see how actually trivial some of the things that that we do worry about a great deal actually are uh, and we touched on it earlier on my mo my personal motto for for many years has been two words keep attacking and I don't necessarily mean that in the way of physically attack or, you know, carry out a military attack, but actually attacking problems that you face and rather than kind of folding into it and, and allowing other people to push you around to actually get onto the offensive and be positive and act positively. And I think that, that sort of message is something that, that many young people that you see nowadays could, could actually benefit from. I want to delve into that a little bit. So, I, and by the way, I can give you some anecdotal evidence. Just a few years ago, I was at school and, you know, all of my teachers, let's say, in the humanities would preach and preach and preach about kind of left-wing attitudes and, and it was really, really bad. And I know that uh, among many of my peers from lots of different schools, this is definitely a phenomenon that, that happens and is definitely happening right, right now. I didn't go to university, so I can't comment on that. <laughs> um, but yeah, keep attacking. I mean, that's a fantastic motto. It's really, really interesting. It's almost Churchillian in that, you know, never, 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 never give up. Um, and you've, you've demonstrated that throughout your whole life and your whole career that we've talked about. You've talked about the direct action that you were taking in Afghanistan. You know, all, all throughout that, being in the army, you've taken that view that we shouldn't st t step back, we should take an active role in dealing with all the problems, whatever they are, no, you know, small or big, and I think that's a fantastic attitude to have. So let's say that I'm a young person that you're facing now who feels completely lost, who feels that they have no purpose in life, who feels that there's, what's the point of living? It's all just completely, um, you know, not materialistic, there's no consequences for my actions, everything it, it is just wrong and I, I may, perhaps I'm depressed or I'm not, not happy with the way things are. What's your message to me? What's your message to me right now? Well, I think, I think <coughs> you know, the important thing is to have a purpose in life and to to identify a way forward. And as I mentioned before, I was very lucky myself in always having a particular career ambition. But I think a per, you know, an, an identifiable purpose that is not, and I go back to this point, is not actually on the internet, does not involve some kind of virtual world, which, which is, is, I think, you know, potentially quite damaging to our, our mentalities. Um, so I, th I think you know, es establishing a purpose and establishing a, a reason for, um, for, 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 for being, and, and, and that to a large extent, I think I would certainly see it as being not, not so much what you can take from the world, but what you can give to the world and what you can contribute and how, how you know, we're all part of society and how much we can give to society. And, you know, one thing that strikes me, which I would recommend to anybody, absolutely anybody, and it's not for everybody, is a time in the military. And, you know, that does give a purpose to people's lives. It does, you know, it's changed a lot over the time since I uh, first joined the army, but it, but it certainly continues to give a, a reason and a purpose and a, a challenge to your life. And I think that's something that, that many people could consider, but of course it isn't for everybody. And the same kind of the military ethos of seeking perfection, of challenging yourself, of, of trying, to, trying to better yourself and to improve yourself and to move forward, I think that ethos is something that could apply to almost anybody in almost any 
environment and in any situation. And it's like, you know, you, you made the, the, you quoted Churchill, never give in, never give in. In that speech that Churchill made, I think it was in 1943 in his, uh, his former school, um, he, he, in Harrow, he, he um, said, you know, th this, these are not, and this is, a, this is in a time before the US came into the Second World War, when the, you know, the, there was, nobody could predict we were going to actually win the war. We were still on the back foot to a very large extent. Yet he said, these are not dark days, these are great days. And what he meant by that was even though we're facing the most incredible adversity, it is, in some ways it's an honour to be in that situation where we, you know, you, we are in adversity and we're going to overcome that. We're going to do everything to overcome that adversity. Uh, whatever the challenge, we just don't give in, don't surrender to it. And I think, I think that message resonated well at his school and, and would also reward other people by reading that speech of his Never Give In. Colonel Richard Kemp, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure.